Well, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me back um, to, to talk um, about um, my passion, which is um, safeguarding adults at risk. And as you can see, if I just bring up my title, there we are. I'm not very good at IT and talking and reading all at the same time, so it might get in a bit of a muddle. Um, what I want to talk about this afternoon is this issue, as it says up there, is prevention is better than cure. Um, it's vital to me that we start thinking much further down the line about how to prevent situations of abusive practice developing uh, rather than just literally thinking of what do we do uh, once it's happened. And the, 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 the where my talk has come from is, is that I was actually asked this question a couple of years ago when I was asked to do a chapter for a book. And they said to me, you've got 500 words, Lynn, to write down your professional legacy. What would you put down on your deathbed? What would you be passing on on your deathbed uh, to your colleagues? And I was thinking, well, actually, I wouldn't be... Hopefully, I'll live to a ripe old age and I'll have long since forgotten what my job was, so I won't be passing on anything about my, my profession. Um, and the only thing I'll be talking about on my deathbed is telling the kids that there's actually just about money left to bury me, but no mother money left at all. But, you know, so I took, uh, metaphorically speaking, what would I be passing on uh, on, on my deathbed? And um, I had to write down <coughs> ten things um, that I thought was important about safeguarding. And those ten things um, are what has developed, first of all, in, in the small book, which was called Not Another Care, Care Handbook. And then I then developed what were my thoughts from my experiences of doing many, many, many uh, institutional abuse, or as they're now called in the Care Act, organisational abuse, um, investigations in health and social care settings. What is it that from all the information and knowledge that I've learnt through those investigations, that leaders, if they thought about these things from a safeguarding perspective, um, might help them from ending up in situations where their hospital ward or care home is being investigated under safeguarding and, um, heaven forbid, end up being on a panorama programme. Because certainly from um, the panorama programmes after the, the one that came out last year, uh, many very dedicated and caring senior managers said to me, but how will I know, Lynn? How will I know? My, you know what's, what goes on behind closed doors? What goes on in your care settings, whether it's a hospital ward or, um, or residential setting or a school? What goes on when you are not physically in that room? How do you know that your staff are not doing what you've seen on some of these television programmes? And I said uh, to, to, to this particular colleague, you know that you can be 99% sure that your staff are not behaving the way that you've seen on some of these television programmes, not because you just cross your fingers and hope, but actually because of all the things you've put in place beforehand, all the things that you do routinely, those tiny little things that you do routinely as a good leader, means that the chances are it's not happening in your work setting. So... For me, the value of leaders is not just being a manager. That a leader, we must show how we prevent abuse in everything that we do, in every aspect of our work. And that leadership is much more than good management. As this, as this says, as Drucker said, management is about doing things right, and leadership is about doing the right thing. Now, in the Care Act, as was just mentioned before, which is um, where we've now got a legislation enshrining adults um, safeguarding, um, which basically means they've put into law that they've got to have adult safeguarding boards. Apart from that, it's all a bit wishy-washy, but don't start me on that one. Um, that they have actually put that there's six principles of safeguarding. Empowerment, protection, prevention, proportionality, partnership, and accountability. And they said that those six principles should run through everything that we do, everything that we should do when we're working with people who are at risk of abuse and neglect. So what I felt, what I feel very strongly, is that prevention, and when you read these, the, the um, examples that they give in the statutory guidance, and they talk about prevention, they talk about prevention after something's happened, what are you going to do to prevent it happening again? And what I think we need to be doing is thinking about what do we do, what do most of you do now without realising it 
do you do to prevent things happening in the first place? That's what prevent is all about. That's what prevention is about. Not closing the door half after the horse is bolted. It's about doing it before it ever starts to bolt in the first place. So many of the things I'm going to come th run through this afternoon, you'll be sitting there thinking, well, she's teaching grandmothers to suck eggs. It will highly likely be that 90% of the things that I'm going to run through in a moment, you will already know and you will already do. But whether or not you think about them in the context of safeguarding, that will be the question. And that will be something that I think you will probably be asking yourselves. So when I was writing the, the, the book, um, my, my little book of safeguarding, which they didn't let me call it a little book of safeguarding, they said they didn't sound very professional. So they said it had to be called a care leader's guide. But it was actually a little book, because it, it is only a little book. And the thing that I, I came across when I was doing some work at the Department of Health was the small bone resilience model. And I think this really, really strikes home um, about what prevention really is. And the Lucy Fouth... Lucy Faithful Foundation, they use the model um, when they're working with perpetrators of child sexual abuse. The traditional model of working with uh, people uh, who abuse, whether it's people who abuse adults or people who abuse children, is the deterrent model. It's also the resistance training model, where we teach people to keep safe. We teach vulnerable adults how not to um, get tricked by rogue traders. We teach them how not to give away their passwords, uh, you know, when someone phones up and says, I'm from your bank, tell me your bank details. So we're trying to help people to protect themselves. And with the deterrent model, the traditional approach to safeguarding, whether it was for children or for adults, it's about or hoping, fingers crossed type of approach, that people will take responsibility when they hear or see reports about other organisations and what's happened to them. And that they'll sit there and say, goodness me, that was a very interesting report that I read about that hospital up there in the Midlands, so I'm going to make sure that that sort of thing doesn't happen in where I work. Well, what's happened, we've only got to look at how many years reports have been coming out about adult safeguarding, how many times Panorama have made programmes, or Channel 4, or any of the other programmes have been made about abuse and neglect of vulnerable adults or adults at risk to know that actually the deterrent model doesn't work. Because people don't sit there and say, goodness me, that's happened 300 miles away, I better make sure it's not happening on my patch. What they do is they sit there and say, goodness me, looks what happened over there. That's a terrible place to work, isn't it? I'm glad I don't work there. That's what happens. So what Smallbone said is that we've actually got to turn all this on its head, that prevention has got to be resilience. And he identified this resilience model and looked at prevention as primary, secondary and tertiary. So he looks at primary prevention is where we should be thinking about raising general awareness. So in everyday practice, what are we doing to be ensuring that people have a general understanding about either how to keep people safe or how to behave in an appropriate way? Secondary prevention is about specific activity to prevent abuse. Um, which could include supervision, it could include training, it could include role modelling of positive practices. Re in the context that we're here this afternoon, the role modelling of experienced leaders in how to work with and to support someone in crisis. That is a secondary prevention model. And the tertiary prevention, that is when we deal with reflection and we look at an inquiry if something has gone wrong. So that is the third stage, which at the moment, from what I can read of the Department of Health, they're calling prevention. But under Smallbone's model, that's the third stage of prevention. So I used this model when I was thinking about how we can be developing and moving forward and thinking about things. And I, I looked at what I had uh, identified through my years and uh, in, in my little book I've put down 10 points, which I call about my 10 points of safeguarding, uh, my safeguarding compass. I, this afternoon, haven't got time to go through all of them, but I wanted to talk through some of them. Some of them are self-explanatory, some of them are obvious, 
things that, but just you might not have thought of it in the context that this is part of your safeguarding plan. So when you're having to do your NHSLA uh, reports to make sure you get the right insurance cover or whatever it is you're having to do, CQC reports or whatever, start thinking outside the box. Adult safeguarding isn't just about having a policy and sending people on a two-hour training programme that they've forgotten an hour later. That is not safeguarding. Safeguarding is thinking right back to, to day one to before you've even employed somebody. So if you're starting to think you have a, uh, you're, you're working and leading a ward and you're worried that will your ward end up on Panorama, or if you've actually been roped in as a practice developer to look at why is it that ward is having a higher number of incidents than another ward, Perhaps some of these things are things that you should also be thinking about that I'm just going to run through briefly now. But as I say, not all of them. Oh, quick swig of vodka. Oh, sorry, water. <laughs> bit early to admit that one, isn't it, really? Integrity is the first thing, the most important thing. Believe in yourself. Another word, I think, for integrity when it comes to safeguarding is bravery. You have to be brave because you have to be the one that's going to be prepared to stand up and be counted. Being the one that's going to put your head above the parapet and be machine gunned. Be the one that's actually going to make career-limiting decisions. And by that, being the one that will perhaps say things that the senior managers don't want to hear. That is a very brave thing for any leader to do, something that managers don't always do. If you're a manager that's also a leader or a leader that's also a manager, that's brilliant. But if you're just a manager, you need to be thinking, how am I also a leader? Thinking about career-limiting activity um, is very scary. For myself, my most career-limiting activity was when I actually whistled blue on a hospital ward and then also led the investigation into the widespread neglect that was going on on that ward. It was fine until we actually uh, got the police involved. And then, for the next six months, um, people kept mistakenly sending me emails that had been going around the chief executive and the directors of nursing about how we're going to get rid of this person. So I have been there and I've got the T-shirt and I've got the scars to prove what it's actually like to take career-limiting decisions. But for me, that's what integrity means and that's what um, being brave in your professional capacity is all about. Care and compassion is absolutely at the heart of everything we do. I, I missed the presentation this morning, but I understand the focus of that very much was around care and compassion. How do we, how do your staff show their head, their heart and their hands in everything they do? How do they greet the, the patients, the residents, the service users, firstly as a fellow human being and then as a person who needs their professional skills and support? How do you see those tiny things that's going on in your care setting every day? That means people feel cared for, so therefore they feel safe, so therefore they feel less vulnerable and less likely to uh, uh, re react in, a, in an adverse way. How do you know that your culture is a positive culture and that you can reinforce that positive culture and take pride in that culture that's being delivered in that care setting? All of these things are care and compassion. We must challenge barriers to care and compassion. We must remember to ask why. Why can't we do that? Why is it that that person's not allowed to have X, Y, and Z? Recently, I was in a care home not to do with restraint, restra re restraint reduction. It was to do with court protection. This chap came from one of the Mediterranean countries, age 94, always had a glass of wine every day. It's what you do when you come from the Mediterranean. Nice place to live, if you ask me. In this care home, wasn't getting his glass of red wine. Why not? Well, says the manager. Regulations. Regulations have said we can't give him a glass of red wine. What regulations? Are, well, you know, she said, we have lots of regulations these days. She couldn't tell me what regulations, but there was the regulations. 
Now, that is going through the Court of Protection, and for five months, in my capacity as an expert witness, I have been telling the judge, this man should be able to have a glass of wine if he wants a glass of wine. And five months later, do you know, that manager is still saying, regulations. Regulations. Now, to me, that's a tiny little thing, you can say a glass of wine, but actually, that is telling me far more about that manager and about how that manager may or may not be running that care home than just about a glass of wine. It's not about a glass of wine. It's about what she is saying about how she runs her home and how she sees that gentleman. So never underestimate what might seem like a tiny little thing, because if you just stop and think about it for a minute, it might start telling you all sorts of other stuff. So with care and compassion, little advert, after tea, come to me sit and see session and you'll hear all about it and how to find out whether your residents and patients are getting their glasses of red wine or not, when you're not there. Privilege. Caring is a privilege, not a right. We must encourage staff to feel privileged that they have been chosen to work in your care environment. We have a license to practice those of us who are privileged enough to be on a register. That's not a right. I've just received me a letter from the NMC that I've privileged enough next month to be paying £120 to the NMC. And in April next year, I'm privileged enough to be one of the first people to go through revalidation. Whoopee! I'm really privileged about that. Seriously, it is a privilege. It's not my God-given right that something I was, I, I was awarded in 1980 <coughs> remains with me until the day I die. I have to earn that right. So it's exactly the same as a driving licence. You have your driving licence because you learnt to drive, you passed a test, you get your licence. If you don't obey the rules of the road, PC Plod comes along and your licence gets taken away. That's the name of the game. So why do we, those of us who are lucky enough to have a registration, why do some of us think that it's a right to life membership? It's not. And we must be sure that everyone takes that same sense of pride that we are the members of a very privileged club. And we must make sure that there aren't any other members that actually we don't want in that club because it's not a right, it's a privilege. We should make sure that we use positive language in handovers. One of the big things, I, I know I mentioned it last year, but when we, the panorama, the, a lot of the negative language that was being spoken about Joan in that panorama last year was being said in the corridors, was being said in the staff rooms. So, if, so they, they would have heard, if the managers and leaders had actually had their ears open, they would have heard that there was very negative stuff going on in that care setting. So if people just keep their ears and eyes open, they will hear and they will see what is being said or thought about. So if we just think about small bones model, just for a second, uh, just to give you a bit of a flavour, primary <coughs> prevention is that we could, just this is just an example, all right? Put up a poster or display to staff about what made you feel proud today. How do we make staff feel proud? Well, I felt proud because actually I think that bloke's now getting his glass of red wine because I checked with the solicitor. It took a lot of work and he's getting his glass of red wine. That made me feel proud. Not that I wrote a nice report for the judge, actually. It was he gets his glass of red wine. Secondary prevention is to support the team to develop a list of banned words and phrases that are organisational or negative towards patients and residents. How do we develop the positive language that we accept? We have language that we use now here. You know, you're very conscious when you're speaking at a conference of not to say a word. That was used ten years ago because that makes you sound old-fashioned. So why aren't we doing the same thing in our everyday work? We can. And tertiary, a response to an actual situation, tertiary prevention is if there is an incident where a staff member ignores a patient or a resident or puts them down or acts inappropriately, shows disrespect, 
how do we actually hold them to account? Doesn't mean discipline, doesn't mean sack. It means sitting down and talking with them and saying, hang on a minute, let's talk about that language you just used. How do you think that might have made Alison feel when you referred to her in that way? That is the tertiary prevention. That is nipping things in the bud, which to me is what prevention is all about. The dangers of groupthink, I think I really think this is an important issue that we we need to grapple with. Groupthink was what they um, understood was the reason why the uh, Space Challenger crashed, because um, in the room there were people, experts, who thought that the tiles were not safe, but they didn't feel they could say, because it was a room full of experts and they didn't want to be the one that sounded like a plonker. So groupthink is really dangerous. And the seven symptoms of groupthink, they tell me in the learned journals, are that we ignore obvious signs of concern um, or, or the group is overly optimistic about putting things right. Yeah, yeah, we can solve that. That's simple. The group discredits concerns. Well, that wouldn't happen here. That doesn't go on here. No, no, we're far more professional than that. They believe they're morally correct. That manager, she was right not to let that bloke have a glass of red wine. They have negative stereotypes about their rivals who may be a threat. And I, I thought that was very interesting because how often do you hear that, you know, in the NHS, but well, care homes, we know what care homes are like. They're all bad places. You hear that organisational arrogance in some places about services that are offered by another place, based on nothing except strange views. Anyone who disagrees with the majority is labelled as disloyal. They don't want to speak out, and if they do speak out, well, they're not a member of the club. A false perception that everyone agrees, that some people just keep quiet because they actually don't want to say, and that some members self-select a role of protecting the group from adverse information. Well, I didn't think you needed that report. I read it and I've decided there's nothing in it that you lot need to read. You're fine as you are. So there are symptoms, there are things that go on, that become normal, that become part of the culture of small groups, large groups, middle-sized groups, that mean groupthink is a very dangerous thing and something we need to be aware of. Because if you've got groupthink, how will you be that person that's going to put their head above the parapet and say, actually, I really don't like the fact that we do X, Y, and Z, that we lock all the doors and take the keys away, that people aren't allowed in their bedrooms. That's not right. To stand up and say that is actually very brave. And to stand up and say that in a culture where the group think is actually it's the safest thing not to let them go into their bedrooms, you know, because there might be ligature points in there. So we'll lock the doors and that keeps them safe so they won't hang themselves. So we've got into a strange sort of way of thinking, well, yeah, that is keeping them safe. But actually, is it the right approach by, by depriving them of, of depriving many people because of the risks, perhaps, of one or two. Smarter, safe selection. Now, I'm not going to go through uh, selection processes. You all know the, 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 the right selection processes. You all know about uh, DBS and about um, uh, references and all of that sort of stuff. But what... What concerns me and what puts what makes me think it's a very important safeguarding issue, as well as those things, is about thinking about cultural issues towards and attitudes towards certain groups. Are we sure that the, the staff in our teams or individuals in our teams have an, a, an attitude towards any particular conditions? Is there anything from their cultural background which could mean that they struggle with coming to terms with the fact that this person is behaving this way because of a mental illness rather than because of something from their culture that says it's something else? Witchcraft, for example. 
Now, I'm not suggesting for one second that we shouldn't employ people from cultural backgrounds where they have a belief that certain things that we call mental illness is actually caused through witchcraft. But if you're not aware of that, and if you actually haven't had those conversations and helped them to understand how we see these illnesses, then you could already be on a hiding to nothing. Another important thing that perhaps I'm being very brave to say now, are you confident your clients, your service users, can understand what your staff are saying? Is their accent so broad? We now have language school, we, we check their language, which is brilliant. But can they understand the accents? Something that we can't, we frightened to say. But if you can't understand what your colleague is saying because they have the most wonderful accent from somewhere around the world, which isn't local to where you're working, I have to say, because if everyone's got the same accent, then you're all all right, aren't you? But it's when someone comes from another part of the world and they're in a, you know, foreign parts, like down in East Sussex, where we don't have an accent, everyone else has an accent. Um, you, know, you know what I mean by that? If you can't understand your colleague, how can you expect your patient to? And if your patient doesn't understand your colleague, how can you expect them to work with that colleague? How can you then expect them to interpret what they're saying correctly? How can you expect them to react correctly? And how can you expect the situation not to escalate into something you didn't want it to escalate to? And the third thing about start smarter, safe selection is a chestnut that I do crack on about quite a lot, is when you're employing staff from overseas or from another part of, of, of even from the UK, how do you ensure that staff understand local customs, local traditions and local practices? How can you be sure that if you've employed somebody to come and work in the West Midlands, or so, so Derbyshire, let's say, where they call everyone me ducks? Now, you start saying that down in East Sussex, and I have to say, you'll be, you know, you'll be out on your ear, because that is, you just don't do it. But in Derbyshire, that is fine. In the West Country, they, I can't remember what they say in the West Country, lovely lover and all that. Well, what's wrong with that if you're in De Devon? So if people don't understand, that is okay in this part of the world. Possibly not, you know, in, in Hempstead Heath. So you must be sure that your staff know local customs and traditions so that they don't end up upsetting people. So that is a gallop through some of the key issues for me that mean you can start thinking about how do you prevent things happening? What are those some examples of tiny little things that you could just be thinking about to give you the confidence to know that when you go home at night, you're not going to end up on Panorama? Because you won't. Because you are leading from a, a very strong perspective. And something that is very important to me that a social worker said to me many many years ago when I said but you know i am be one person what can I do and she said if everyone lit one candle in the darkness if everyone lit one candle the room would soon be lit and that's what we must all do just always light one candle and then the room will be lit thank you